So greetings everyone, my name's Kelvin and um, I'd like to welcome you to the second of Mooney Valley Library's online author events. Uh, first, a little background on Favel. The first novel uh, was um, Pass, um, Pass the Shallows and that sold very successfully internationally. It was shortlisted listed for the Miles Franklin Award and won the Dobby Literary Award and resulted in Favel winning the Australian Book Industry Awards Newcomer of the Year um, Award in 2012. The next novel, When the Night Comes, was also critically acclaimed. Her latest novel, There Was Still Love, was listed for the Stella Prize being beaten actually by next week's speaker, Jess Hill, and her book, See What You Made Me Do. However, the book did win the Indie Book Awards 2020 Book of the Year. The judges of this award commented that, that this novel is a love letter to the stories that Parrot has, has, has been shaped by and the personal history that it once defines and directs us. Melodious and, 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 and poetic, this book is easy to love. Please welcome Favel Parrot. Thank you so much for having me um, on this winter night. It's lovely we can all be at home and not out in the cold. So I'm going to talk about my novel, There Was Still Love, um, a little bit tonight. And hopefully you'll have some great questions for me or any questions. So this novel found me in a really strange way. I was in Northland Shopping Centre, which is not somewhere that I love. and. Um, I was lost. I couldn't find the exit to the car park. Instead, right in front of me was a European deli that I'd never seen before. I went in and um, there on the shelves, right in front of my eyes, uh, were some Czechoslovakian gherkins that I haven't tasted or hadn't tasted since I was 16 years old. So I bought all of them. There were eight jars. God knows how long they had been there. Um, they were dusty and they were warm. But I eventually found the car park, got into my car, I opened up one of the jars, I bit into a gherkin and um, I burst into tears immediately because I was back in the flat that my grandparents lived in and was my first hut home. I wanted so much to go to that flat, um, to drive there and to run up the stairs and for them to be there. But they passed a long time ago. So all I could do was drive to the cemetery where they're buried and sit with them. And I said that day, please tell me everything about you. I know nothing about you before me. I don't know. Um, what you were like when you were young, what you wanted to be when you were young, how you met, how you fell in love, all those things. I'm going to quickly read about this flat, this first home of mine, this first heart home. It's a really strong memory for me. Our footsteps echo as we climb the stairs. My grandma holds my hand. Shh, be quiet. My grandpa is sleeping. The third floor flat, the heavy wooden door and inside the smell of warm pipe tobacco and homemade cakes. Home. Take your coat off, hang it in the coat rack. Take your shoes off, put them in the shoe rack. Put on your slippers. Mine are red and my grandma's are blue. My grandpa's are brown, but they are in his room where he's sleeping. Down the hall, past my grandma's bedroom and past my grandpa's bedroom, past the green tiled bathroom and into the small light kitchen. My grandma puts the cloth shopping bag on the table. It has flowers on it and zips up into a small leather wallet when it is not being used. It is a good bag and it holds a lot. It comes from Czechoslovakia. I unpack the shopping. Three Kaiser rolls, a wrapped paper parcel with six slices of Swiss cheese inside, a paper parcel with six slices of Parisa sausage inside, a loaf of rye bread with caraway seeds, a jar of Nova gherkins, one round black and green tin, Dr. Pat pipe tobacco for my grandpa. My grandma fills up the kettle over the sink and sets it on the stove. 
She lights a match and the gas ring explodes blue. That sweet smell of gas. My grandma blows out the match, then breaks it in half with her fingers. She drops the broken match into a glass ashtray. It is full of match halves, one half clean, the other blackened and burnt. I hear the toilet flush. My grandpa is awake. My grandma scoops loose tea into the shiny teapot. She smiles at me and then begins to sing. One, two, three, grandma caught a flea, put it in the teapot, made a cup of tea. Flea jumped out, grandma gave a shout. Here comes grandpa with his shirt hanging out. I join in with that last line and just like that, my grandpa opens up the kitchen door. He's wearing his white singlet and striped pajama bottoms and his brown slippers, his face still puffy with sleep. I laugh at his crazy sticking up hair, at the way he always looks so surprised to be alive. He sits down at the green table next to me. He pats my head. My grandma makes the tea. So that's the first thing I wrote, thinking that it was just some memories about my grandparents and it would be just for me. Maybe a short story about gherkins, um, but I never imagined it would become a novel because I don't know my grandparents' story. I don't know what it's like to grow up in Czechoslovakia. So this book is about my grandma and her twin sister who were born in 1920 in Czechoslovakia. Um, at age 16, just before World War II, they were separated um, and my grandma went to London and her sister was stuck in Prague not knowing what would happen with big world history, they imagined they'd be reunited after the war, but um, we all know um, what happened um, with communism and Stalin and then the Russian invasion in 68. So these twins spent their life on opposite sides of the world, seeing each other every mm, 10 years if they could afford to. My grandma would save all of her coins and put them in a gherkin jar and those coins would turn into tickets home. So this is a really strong memory for me. I wanted to capture that. But what I didn't know I would write is a young boy in Prague in 1980 living under communism but living with his grandma. Um, I got really lucky because I didn't feel confident enough to write this voice. I hadn't lived it, it's not my story. I didn't want to write a caricature of what it's like to grow up in communism. I wanted to write ordinary life, very ordinary life. So luckily, thanks to the wonders of Facebook, my cousin who grew up in Prague and still lives there, who is my age and grew up with his grandma, my great auntie, contacted me on Facebook. We hadn't spoken for 30 years. So that was amazing. And I told him what I was doing. And he very quickly said, Favel, please ask me questions. I want to be back in that flat with my grandma, just like you do. I want to be back there. I want to tell you everything, everything about that time. So we would message every day while I was writing. I would write in the mornings and then in the evenings I would message Martin. And he helped me so much. Um, I, like I said, I wanted to get ordinary life. What is it like to go to school, to come home? What did you have for dinner? These sorts of things. Like if somebody looked in a window of an apartment block and saw a family having dinner, that's what I wanted to capture, not the big political history, because we all kind of know that. That story has been told. But the ordinary lives of children and of grandparents I don't think they have been told. And one thing that I remembered and that my cousin told me was that grandmas ran Prague. And I do remember this now. Um, grandmas were buying, wheeling and dealing on the black market. They were keeping everything going. One thing you might not know is that 
every single adult in Czechoslovakia at that time had to have a job. You couldn't be unemployed. You couldn't be a stay-at-home mother, even if you had 10 kids. So you had to have a job. If you didn't have one, the state found you one. This left a massive gap in childcare. Um, so this fell to grandparents. So grandmas ran this city. They kept everything going. They put food on the table. They got kids to school. They looked after babies. They kept the day-to-day -day life running. Um, and I don't believe their story's been told. So I wanted to tell their story um, in this book, and I hope I have done that. I'd like to give you a taste of this little boy, Lujic, who's loosely based on my cousin, although he does want you to know that he um, never wanted, never, I mean, sorry, um, went to the park trying to catch people kissing like this boy does. So this is a very different voice. So now we're in Prague in 1980. Pigeons. There are 500 million pigeons in this city. They shit on everything. They shit on the sculptures, on the heads of all those stone saints. The famous people from history are covered in shit. Once a pigeon shat on Bubby's head, but it never happened to him. He is too quick. He runs too fast and the shit never gets him. He is invisible. It is his superpower. He can fly through the streets, move past eyes unnoticed. He can slip right under the heavy blanket that covers this city and the fear cannot touch him. Lujek is free and he sees everything. A teenage girl in a tight yellow skirt is blowing bubbles in the square. Little rainbow spheres of light. Two girls with the same long hair are trying to clap the bubbles dead in their hands. They are screeching, laughing, smashing the bubbles between their red sticky palms. But some of the bubbles get away, rise up high and fly with the city. They fly with the birds look down. Maybe some even make it all the way across the river. Lujek does not know. He cannot see that far. The clower, tower clangs once, twice. Lujic feels each strike of the clock right in his guts. It shakes him into action. Three times, four, clang, it's 5 p.m. The day is falling away right in front of him. He is not meant to be over this side, not so far away from home, and there is only one hour left before he has to be flying up those stairs to the flat. One golden hour. He runs through the tower and onto the bridge. It is already busy with workers, men moving in their dark suits, women in skirts, spring coats, handbags, satchel, shoes, boots. Two old timers are already drunk, tripping and slipping over their own feet. What jokers, go home and get out of my way. Lujek weaves his way through the cloud with stealth. He knows the statues by heart on the bridge. He has names for them all and he yells them out as he runs. Hey, fat guts. Hey, stupid. Hey, dum dum. Hey, sleepy. Hey, hunchback. Hey, squint eyes. The only statue he likes is the lady with the pointy crown and he never yells insults at her. He calls her by a name, Barbara. Barbara, my Barbara. He likes the way the name makes his mouth move. Barbara. A woman in front of him stops and looks around. He must have yelled that last Barbara out a bit too loudly. He moves faster. Bobby would kill him if she found out he was yelling at saints. And he would get the wooden spoon for sure and no dinner. She would tell him that statues would get their revenge on him. But he does not believe any of those old stories. The ones about statues coming to life at night. He is not a baby. The statues are just old, dead stone. They are not going anywhere in a hurry. Up yours, pointy, he yells at St. Augustine. Then he cuts a hard left and zips down the zigzag stairs two at a time. He's on the home side now, and there is time for his favourite place, the camper. 
So that's Prague, 1980, which is somewhere that I didn't grow up. I know a little bit, but um, I had to imagine. And thanks to my cousin, um, I got these stories from him about this city that was black and dirty and um, falling to pieces and children had a hell of a lot of freedom more than they do now and grandmas ran the city. Um, this book didn't come to me in order like all of my novels. <laughs> I tend to write completely out of order, not knowing the story. So I started with the Gherkins. I jumped around different memories of my grandparents. Um, one strong memory I have is that the only time the TV was on in the flat was if um, Czech people were playing tennis <laughs> in the Australian Open. So um, we spent a lot of summer watching tennis with my grandma. So that made it into the book, all these little memories of mine, plus all of this fiction that I had to make up, these people's lives, um, things that I'll never know the truth about but I feel like I got close to by being with them. And one thing I'd like to say to everyone out there, one, if you're a grandparent, please write stuff down. Your grandkids might not be ready to hear your stories yet, but one day they will really want to hear them and you might not be there. So I would give anything to um, have a couple of hours with my grandparents and ask them about their lives. And I mean, not dates, in fact, we can find them out. I mean, what makes up a life? Because we're made up of stories. So um, when did your heart first break? What did you love to do as a child? What made you laugh? What were you frightened of? Those things. And if you're a younger person and your grandparents are alive, immediately after this, go and see them. Please um, don't leave it. Don't wait because... Um, these stories turn to dust once they're gone. So then you have to make it up like me. And I wish that I didn't have to make it up. I just wish they were here and I could ask them. <laughs> um, that's the message I like to try and tell everyone. So yeah, I wrote it out of order. I never thought it would be published, which gave me a hell of a lot of freedom. But I wanted it to be perfect because it was for my grandparents and I felt like they were there in the room. So I drafted very heavily. Um, every scene, oh, 10 to 15 drafts. So um, for me, that's a lot. Um, normally it's maybe 10. So this, I had to rake out every word until I had the essence of this story, of these people, until, um, yeah, until I, I felt like every scene was perfect and then I felt like, okay, I can move on to the next scene. So once I had um, a lot of these scenes um, with no real way of knowing what the structure would be, um, that's the hard part for me. That's when I cry a lot and um, usually have a few wines and um, I have to get all of the scenes on the floor and try and move them around to see which bits might gel. Um, what's the story here? What's missing? What needs to be taken away? What does the reader need to know now? So structure is really hard. Um, if you think about structure, there's a million ways. Who's telling the story? Is it first person, third person? How many voices? Are we going from the middle, backwards and forwards? Are we going from the start and in a chronological way? Are we going to go from the end and move backwards? There's so many ways. Um, this book is my most complicated book, even though it's so short. So it's... 1938 to 1981, set in Melbourne and in Prague, but it's also got all the big history of Czechoslovakia and the UK and Australia. Um, it's got multiple voices in it, just little snapshots of these adults in this, amongst these grandkids who are telling us the story. Um, and it's got uh, it moves tenses a fair bit and it's got first person and third person. So it was pretty crazy process for me and I, I wasn't sure the whole way. It felt very uncomfortable and luckily I, um, I trusted something. An example I'll give you of trust and how the process works is the last thing I wrote is the first page of the book. Um, to me, this sums up 
the whole book. So I'm going to read this. It's a very short section. I know I've read a lot, but I wanted to give you a taste. Um, so this is called The Suitcase. There are suitcases everywhere. They cover the country. Little brown suitcases on trains and on carts. Suitcases strapped to the top of buses. There are suitcases being carried along old country roads by women, by men, dragged by children. There are suitcases abandoned in ditches. Suitcases left broken in stairwells. People carry little brown suitcases. Inside, all they can hold. A set of warm clothes, a photograph of loved ones, a treasured book. They carry little suitcases to imagine safety and hope to find a place where they can put their suitcase down and unpack. You must become a little brown suitcase. You must close up tight, protect your most needed possessions, all you can hold. Your heart, your mind, your soul. You must become a little suitcase and try not to think about home. So it was the perfect beginning that came at the end. For me, the little brown suitcase represents the war. It represents refugees like my grandparents. But something really interesting happened to me when I was reading this piece. A young boy who was eight years old put his hand up and said, why does the suitcase have to be brown? I have a red suitcase. And everyone laughed. <laughs> But it was a great question because us older people <laughs> know what a, a brown leather suitcase represents. It's a certain time. It really does represent this period of time. But nowadays, refugees have all sorts of bags, backpacks, all different colored suitcases, Hessian bags, whatever they can hold. It's the same. So I loved his question because it really made me think about this is still happening to people right now. This is still happening to people, carrying possessions in hope of safety, leaving everything else behind. So I hope that people can feel that and um, have some compassion for the people who are going through that now, just like many of our relatives before us and I know um, that's a sad note to sort of end on but I'm hoping that we have some questions that might bring it back up <laughs> um, I've loved talking to you guys it's so nice I'm wearing my tracksuit under this dress I just want to let you know <laughs> thanks Fabel that was uh, that, uh, that was really great and um, I think it is a, a universal story that you that you're telling it's still relevant now some absolutely of the thank that you that you've um, written about so we have a couple of questions uh first question is did you visit prague why while, while you were writing the novel oh that's a great question and i forgot to talk about that when i was um talking um i went to prague the last time i went to prague i was 21 years old so it was a very long time ago um the wall had just come down, but Prague was still very um, broken and fallen down and how it was in this novel. So that's my memory of Prague and staying with my relatives in the old city in these apartments that now no one can afford to live in. Um, I didn't want to go back because it's changed so much from this novel. But what I do want to do is go back with this novel um, now and um, it is going to be translated into Czech so I'm so excited and I hope that in the future I can um, visit um, Prague because it is a beautiful city and it has been restored to its previous grandeur so that's amazing I mean it's this great city of learning and culture it's, it's you know one of the most beautiful cities in the world so I can't wait to see it um, again. But I had to stay in 1980 for this book. So I knew I couldn't go there now because it is very different. So I had to remember what it was like um, for this little boy um, to keep that real realness, the greediness of what it was like back then. Great question. Yeah, I've, I'm, I went to Prague 
a couple of years ago and it's certainly it's it's certainly become a big tourist mecca i think for it is people. yeah of course i mean it's so beautiful but i think um you know where these people lived in the old city uh hardly any uh people who were born in prague can live there anymore it's mm. all airbnbs or hotels and there's nothing wrong with that it's just um very different than this book um this was a, a dark city with no crime and um, my cousin, no one locked their doors. Um, <laughs> you know, there were very little cars on the road, which is something quite amazing, but there weren't the throngs of um, tourists. But, you know, the Czech Republic is so grateful for the tourism because mm. it's keeping the country going. So. <laughs> now I have another question. Um, has this novel and the feedback you've no no doubt received from people about their grandparents' stories, giving you ideas or inspirations for another novel. Absolutely. I mean, what's been amazing is people have um, come and talked about their grandparents and I found that very moving. Um, everyone's had a story, um, a beautiful story, and um, been inspired to sort of look into family history. There's other people in this novel, some of the adults, um, the mid, that middle generation that I skipped over, deliberately because I just wanted to focus on grandparents and grandkids that they were the people in this book the middle generation have a very different story there's a few characters in this book in the middle generation that I'd love to expand on maybe one day they're fascinating characters that I just got little glimpses of um so yeah that's a great um I'll take some notes and um now, I have a comment rather than a question. Um, so the comment is, I, I really love this novel and it moved me a great deal. My links to Eastern Europe go back over 150 years, but the details you, you, you created about life in the East really resonated about how my life and so many Australians would be so different if our grandparents didn't make those perilous journeys. So your comments about bags and hope were wonderful. Oh, that's so beautiful. And man that's so lovely one thing that um this this um person might have in common with me is that my grandparents never really left their home even though they did so this flat um that I uh, spent a lot of time in when I was young was Prague so I mean like outside was like Eastern Kilda inside was Prague so um from the decor to the food to the classical music, the doily on the TV, the tapestry of Prague, the little knickknacks. And when I went to Prague when I was 21 and visited my grandma's sister, the, her twin, when I went into her flat, I was so bowled over because it was the exact same flat that my grandma lived in the same knickknacks, the same doily on the TV, the same lace curtains, the same tapestry of Prague. They lived in the same flat. And that's when I realised, my God, my grandma never left Prague <laughs> inside. Um, I think that's beautiful. They um, tried, of course, they were Australian. They were happy to be here. They loved this country. But at home, they just wanted to be their old selves, I think. So I think maybe people can relate to that a little bit. I think so, yes. I have a um, another question. Lastly, did you eat all the seven jars of gherkins? <laughs> they've, they're definitely all gone now. I, I, I need more. Um, I'm, a, I'm an addict of gherkins, so they didn't last very long. Plus, my brother asked me for a few jars, so I had to send them to him. Um, we're still on the hunt for these particular Czech gherkins, which it was interesting when the wall was up when the curtain was up you could buy them here at uh the old safeway um but as soon as the curtain came down you couldn't get them anymore here so it, it sort of went the opposite way of what you'd imagine mm. um but i did find them in this deli so I don't, <laughs> maybe i can buy them online yes. <laughs> if anyone has a good recipe for for gherkins please to make your own please um get in contact just find me on my website and that contact will come to me. Yeah, this is like a good idea. <laughs> um, now, um, the your main protagonist, the little girl, um, her nickname is Little Fox, and that's been and that met that imagery has been carried over to the cover of your book. Can you go a little bit 
into more detail about I can. maybe the metaphor or, or yeah absolutely i mean this cover is so beautiful and i can take no credit so one thing you might know about might not know about being an author is we have very little say over the cover we kind of gets given to us and it's been through marketing and they sort of say, we hope you love it. But um, Christabel Designs did an amazing job because here's the young boy in Prague running into the fox and there's some cobblestones and here's the fox. So the little girl's nickname is Maraliska, which means little fox. I wish that that was my nickname when I was little. <laughs> my grandpa used to call me blood nut. I have red hair. So I, I thought, well, that's not a, a very nice <laughs> name. Um, so my cousin and I brainstormed and I said, well, is it possible that a Czech person would call the red headed grandkid little Fox? And he said, yeah, that's quite possible. So we came up with that. And um, the Fox motif has been great. My whole tour around Australia, people gave me fox things. I have about 35 stuffed toy foxes, crocheted foxes, fox bags, fo fox brooches, um, fox hats, fox slippers, <laughs> fox cups. It's quite um, a beautiful thing. I'm, I'm becoming a fox collector. <laughs> um. Now, uh, just another question. Um, so I've, I've, I read a quote from you where you said that this book was the, fast, the fastest book that you've ever written, but it's also the book that you worked hardest on. So I'm just wondering, it, it, this is your third novel. Is writing actually become easier? I wish. I wish, it, I wish every book is different. Every book is really hard. The reason that this one was faster and it's not that fast. Like it took me a year and a half and it's quite short. Um, Past the Shallows took me five years, but this took me a year and a half, but I worked every single day of that year and a half. So I was obsessed. I didn't want to leave the space. I wanted to be with my grandparents the whole time. So I became this crazy recluse. I didn't see people. I didn't go out. I just worked and then went to sleep. So, um, my day would start with coffee and then getting into the novel and I work for five hours at least and then message my cousin, maybe read some something else to try and wind down. Um, and that was my life for a year and a half. Um, I was really hard on myself. Like I said, I drafted more than I've ever drafted. I, I just, I just, all I wanted to do was be, in this book I wanted to be in the flat and I didn't want to let it go so when it was time to finish it was really hard for me to ha hand it over um I felt like my grandparents would go away again um and I was desperate for that not to happen but luckily um they're still with me because I get to talk about it all the time um so that's the nice thing I wish that writing did get easier but then many people say um, maybe it's good that it doesn't because every book is a challenge and um, maybe we wouldn't do it if that was the way. If it was really easy, maybe I wouldn't do it. I don't know. I hate that it's hard. It drives me crazy. But maybe um, our brains need that challenge. Uh, I think our brains are hardwired to problem solve and so that maybe that's why I write out of order, not knowing the story, because my brain needs to be able to try and work it out like the reader is trying to work it out. Um, I wish it wasn't hard, but also if it wasn't hard, we could all do it and, and everyone would do it. And I'd have written 100 books by now <laughs> instead of just three. <laughs> um you um, you quite often use a younger person as a as a as a protagonist in your books. Um, so, what can you see as advantages of doing that? And uh, is there any downside that that you find a difficulty in getting over in using a, a younger yeah. protagonist? Well, talk about the downside first. Is that um, lots of the story is missing if you just um, in the mind of a child. So it's like a, a grid with lots of holes so there's lots of bits missing that drives some readers nuts they want the full bloat fully detailed everything explained story um 
and that's not what I do because um, I believe that children are picking up on all of this energy that's happening around them. They don't necessarily understand everything that's going on, but they understand the feeling of what's going on. So that's what I'm trying to capture. These people are like, what's going on here? Why, is, why are my grandparents talking in a raised voice? What are they talking about? Why um, can I not talk to mum on the phone and not say important things? What's happening here? So the adults are trying to shield the, these ch children from uh, the harsh realities, but the children are trying to work out what's going on. So it's an amazing um, place to be in with lots of holes. You know, I can't tell the full story. I have to allude to things and the, the, the child's always trying to work out what's happening. I find that really fascinating. Um, I, it kind of really speaks to me. It, it adds lots of problems, which is always good as a writer, but it's hard. Um, I have to be really careful and go through like, w would a child really do this or think this or feel this or act like this? Um, but then I also feel like we all have that child person in us um, and we all can remember what it's like to be that little person. Um, that's why in the section I read, I used the song, the one, two, three, grandma caught a flea. I really remember that, but it brought me this, what's happening here in that scene is this ritual that's just for this kid. The ritual, the grandparents don't want to sing the song. They, it's not for them. It's just for this child. And it happens every day, but she's never tired of it. And the granddad opening the door as soon as they say, here comes grandpa with his shirt hanging out. So to be back there, these people doing these amazing things for this child. Um, I was trying to capture that. Um, if I'd done it from the adult perspective, it'd be very different. It'd be like, oh, you know, we've got to sing the song again because Malishka really loves it. Um, it lose the magic a little bit. I'm I'm staying with the magic of like wow, um, every day this song. Wow, Grandpa knows every time to come in. Um, so I'm trying to do that um, with my work. And I guess some sometimes writing from that perspective, you can get to an emotional core of things rather than trying to. Uh, an adult might overanalyze something, whereas a child just takes absolutely, yep. absolutely. Yeah, and that's what I mean about they're feeling the energy. They know mm. when an adult's upset. They, they know what's happening really emotionally, energetically. Um, they understand a lot more than we think. <laughs> mm. um, so are you, what's, your, what's your next project? Well, this is going to take everyone by surprise because it's right out there. Um, you might not know this about me, but uh, three days a week I volunteer at a dingo sanctuary in Tulan Vale, Victoria. So um, it's an amazing place and it's trying to save dingoes from extinction. Um, I love it so much, but there's this incredible thing that happened seven months ago. A dingo pup, cub, sorry, a dingo cub, was what uh, literally fell out of the sky and landed in someone's yard in Wondilagong. When this lovely woman called Jane found this cub, five weeks old, so very small, he had talon marks in his back. So we know from that that he'd been taken by an eagle from his den or home and dropped, luckily dropped, not killed. Well, this... Lovely woman didn't know whether he was a fox, a dog, a, um, she didn't know what he was. She took him to the vet and the vet said, I think he's a dingo. Um, so luck would have it, he made his way to us at the dingo sanctuary and he was tested, um, DNA tested and he's 100% pure alpine dingo, the rarest, the most endangered dingo in Australia. From this, we know there are alpine, pure alpine dingoes in Victoria that need our protection, that his brothers and sisters, his mum and dad and his grandparents are all pure. So this is a massive win for us because we're trying to protect dingoes in the wild. But he's also become the most famous dingo in the world. He has 55,000 followers on Instagram. You can follow him at Wandy Dingo. 
so at Wandy Dingo. Um, or you can come and see him at our sanctuary. We have tours and it's puppy season. It's the best time. So look us up. It's the Dingo Discovery Sanctuary. And I'm writing his story. So it's going to be a middle fiction book so for about eight to 10 year olds. So it's really something different for me. I'm finding it very challenging. Um, one, because my niece and nephews uh, are voracious readers and uh, terrible critics and they often telling me you know this author dropped the ball or I was really unhappy with this author's ending or <laughs> so I know um, that these readers are smart and um, savvy and I have to get it right so that's my next book <laughs> tough audience yeah very tough audience <laughs> Um, now, if anybody has any other questions, please put them in the Q&A section. Um, I had another question. I've, I've flagged with this with you before. Yeah. Uh, um, so we've all been locked down according to COVID, COVID-19, and I think we've experienced life from a different perspective. And I think we've, we've all learned some lessons either about ourselves or about society in general. So I'm just wondering what sort of lessons you've learned, Favreau, and how you might apply those to your writing? It's, it's so weird because it should have been a time for great um, output of writing, but I lost my routine, it, which is weird because my life hasn't changed that much in that I write from home. I'm already set up to do that. Um, one thing is I, I had my husband here the whole time um, at home which was actually really great. So that's one thing, just spending time with the people you love, like real time, because we think we spend time with the people we love, but we don't really, we, like, we're tired after work or this and that, or we're on the phone. Um, we don't really spend time. So it sort of forced us to spend time with the people we love, which has been amazing and actually have real conversations and do things together. Um, I've really loved that. I really missed... Um, my family that live in Northern New South Wales. So my niece and nephew that I talked about and my brother, um, not being able to see them um, has been terrible. Um, but I got to focus on the dingoes. I got to go there even more. So that was great. Um, I loved that. So I think, I think the lesson is for me, you know, um, it's kind of like just say we have this much time, which is what we've just had, and that's all we have. What are we going to do with it? Making the most of our time, not wasting our time, um, really listening to each other, um, trying to do the things that are important, trying to get off our phone a little bit more. Um, I read so much as well. I read more than normal, and I read a couple of books a week, so that was great. Um, I know most people have, well, a lot of people have had a really difficult time, but I've quite enjoyed the time with my husband and also the time just slowing down. Um, I didn't have to do so many events on the road, so I got to stay at home and do events online, which has been quite nice. <laughs> that would be a big, a big, a big, a big change because because I think your tour for this book started around February, was it, or was it? No, it was started in September. So right. I, I toured for two months around Australia, and I um I didn't come home at all in that time, and that's wonderful in itself. You get to see so many places and meet so many people, but it's also exhausting. So um for me, it's been nice. I'm a real homebody, um so it's been really nice. I also built, you know, a veggie patch. I built a deck on the front of the house. It's been quite a constructive time. Although apparently um, DIY um, accidents have been up 300% during COVID-19 times. That's not really surprising, is it? No. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but it, it's kind of funny that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I guess people are trying new things. And yes, that's what it is. Yep. <laughs> um, another question just strikes me. Um, so we're all influenced by the books that, that we read. Who are some, some of the authors that have influenced your writing? Um, I love, um, there's a writer called Sarah Winman, um, who her last book was called Tin Man. I think it's one of the most beautiful books I've ever read. I urge everyone to go and get it from the library. Um, 
all of her books are great. I'm just trying to see if I can grab a, oh, there's a writer from Norway called Per Pedersen, who is my favourite author by a long way. Um, so his most famous book is um, Out Stealing Horses. Here it is. Wait. That's Out Stealing Horses. So go and get that from your library. Um, it's been made into a motion picture as well. So see the film after you read the book because they actually, unlike a lot of books, they actually nailed it with the film. It is perfect. I could not fault the film. It is, it's almost like an homage to the book. So I've read this book so many times and I write all in it. Um, if I'm feeling flat or down or I'm not writing well, I can just pick up this book and read a passage and just, it'll just send me down. So I've probably read this book 40 times. Um, I almost know it by heart. I'm, I love it so much that I'm trying to learn Norwegian so that I can um, read Pedersen in Norwegian one day. One day. That's my dream. What a challenge. <laughs> I love all of his books. So, so check him out. I, you will see the influence, I bet, if you read him, the influence that he's had on my writing. It's immense. Um, does anybody, uh, any of the attendees, have any other questions they'd like to ask Favel? Come on, don't be shy. Come on. So J Jess Hill's going to be the next person coming up? She is. So she'll be next next Monday. That's fantastic. What a brilliant book. That's another brilliant book that I, you know, thanks to the Stella Prize, I hope I hope that more and more people are reading that book. It's so important. Um, I think it's brilliant. I'm, as much as I am sad I didn't win, Jess was the right choice for the Stella Prize, and I'm really proud of that decision. Um, She's just brilliant. Do you read much nonfiction, Favel? Um, not as much as I should. It's funny. Um, the recently I just read the Truganini um nonfiction, and I've read Jess Hills, and I read the Stella List, of course, which have a few nonfiction. Um, I need to do that more. What I love about the Stella Prize is if you uh take the challenge to read everything on the short list or long list, if you're brilliant, um, you'll be challenged out of your comfort zone. So my comfort zone is, is fiction. Um, but the, there was a graphic novel on the long list and it's absolutely brilliant. It's changed the way I see graphic novels. So I love that about the Stella Prize. It's, um, it's so diverse and um, that's fantastic. There's no other prize like it. So if you don't know what to read next, work your way through the Stella um, shortlist or long list. Um, it sounds like a good recommendation. Yeah, it's and a good we, one. Yeah, we can always benefit with more diversity. and Absolutely. And things. Yep. Yeah. Um, I have a, we do have a question from, the, from one of the attendees. Um, I love to... I love to hear Favel's voice. So I hope she does a reading of a next audio book. Do you, do you actually have any <laughs> audio books? In um, oh, that's so kind of you. Look, I'm good at reading a short section, but reading the whole audio book is so hard. And um, for When the Night Comes, they asked me to do a test to see if I could do it. I wasn't sure I wanted to, but after the test, it was like five hours of like um, intense work. And what I came to realise is, um, yes, I can nail all these small bits that come from the heart, but if I read the whole book, it wouldn't be great. And what actors can do is so amazing. So uh, Pastor Shutters was read by David Wenham and um, that he knocked it out of the park. I, I read the book differently now because of his reading. Um, when the Night Comes was Marta Dusseldorp and Ben Winspear, uh, again, incredible. And the amazing up and comer, coming actor and Gary Rice read this and gee, she did a good job. Um, um, I really am grateful for your comment, but yeah, I don't think I could carry off a whole book, but maybe I could do little snippets in a, in a podcast or something. Um, but thank you. That's lovely to hear. We never know how we uh, sound as authors. <laughs> That's right. And it, 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 it is a real discipline and a real expertise to actually. Oh, it's a skill. It's yeah. a skill. And, and, and the people who do it deserve to be paid a lot of money because mm. 
it, it's um, reading a book like this would would take a week of, of in studio time, and it's 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 not just um, a couple of hours. It's intense, and um, yeah, oof, take my hat off to those people who can do that. Um, just just following on from audio books, have you had any approaches from people wanting to film any of your any of your books? Yeah, I've been really lucky. Um, the Pastor Shallows. The film option was um, taken up a long time ago. Um, it got really close to getting um, funding from the Australian uh, film, film funding, but um, it went up against um, Tim Winton's Breath just at the last hurdle. Um, and so we got beaten by Breath, which, you know, I totally understand. Um, once you get a no, it, it, you have to wait for quite a long time. So I think it's a five-year cycle. Yeah. So that's been put back on the shelf. In the meantime... Um, Pastor Shallows has been adapted into a play and um, that's going to be performed hopefully next year because Pastor Shallows is on the HSC list for year 12 in New South mm-hmm. Wales yep. and also taught around Australia in different um, English classes. So uh, I went, I was lucky enough before COVID-19 to go to a reading of the play and it is brilliant. I don't know if, um, for anyone that knows Pastor Shallows, it's very different, but it's just the three brothers on stage, but they somehow pull it off this whole book. It's, I um, mean, awe and um, they're making it into a short film that might be on the ABC fingers crossed. So um, apart and apart from that, no, I have no film news, but we always hope and cross our fingers and who mm. knows. <laughs> so did you have any um, role in adapting the, the book to, um, I, I, I didn't, um, I, I, they asked me if I wanted to be on board, but um, it's very interesting. I'm terrible at um, screenplays. It's a very different discipline. So what I'm doing is showing, not telling, right? So I'm trying to show you the scene. I want you to be in the scene. And what a screenplay has to do is tell. So um, it has to tell who's in the scene, what's happening, and then dialogue. So it's all telling. Mm-hmm. Um I find it really hard. It's a really different skill. I'm, I'm going to keep trying at it, um, but it's not my natural form. Um, who knows? Maybe one day I'll be able to pull it off, but at this point I'm, I'm hopeless at it. And there's people that are really good at it and they can do it much better than I can. So. Yep. <laughs> this is probably a question that I probably should have asked right at the beginning, but how did you actually get into writing and, Oh, yeah, I should have talked about this too. So my story is um, not probably the normal story. Um, I wrote when I was younger and I I did a zine, which is, um, for people who don't know, it's like a blog before the internet. So it's a a photocopied little magazine, fanzine that you'd make and I used to write about bands and um, rants and little things, political things that I thought. um, But I was a D student in English so I was a science student so I I, um, was really good at maths and physics and chemistry um, and biology and my English was terrible and in fact I was in remedial English for a long time and my reading was quite slow I was a slow reader and it wasn't until um, year 12 a librarian at my school asked me um, what would I like to read if I could read anything? And I said, I don't know. I've never read a book that I, I don't even understand how to answer that question. And she was great. And so she kept trying to give me books. And eventually she realized that the, the old Gothic novels like Wuthering Heights and they were the ones for me. So <laughs> I went through the canon of like, <laughs> of these novels in, and I sudden, suddenly started reading a book a week and then I understood what books could do for the first time ever. So thank goodness for that librarian. Um, that changed my life. But then I went on to be a postman um, <laughs> for till I was nearly 30 um, because I thought, wow, oh, I'm no good at English and writing's really hard and it's probably impossible and no one like me would ever become a writer and I haven't been to university and I don't have a creative writing degree or a master's and um it's not for me um but you know I I kept reading and in the back of my head kept dreaming about writing and so when I was 29 ish um that finally came to the surface I thought 
I have to try and do something about this. And um, luckily I went to um, CAE TAFE in um, Melbourne and um, studied professional writing and editing. And I had, again, some great librarians and great teachers. I didn't finish that diploma either. So I'm still a high school graduate, but I did finish past the shallows. So um, I finally finished something and um, I, with that book eventually was able to leave the, the post world behind mm -hmm. and um, become a full-time writer. So what an incredible, I'm just so grateful that I took that chance. So I'd love to tell people it's, um, it's never too late. It's never too late. And if anyone, if I can do it, sorry, anyone can, because I, I believe that it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of time and persistence and it's a lot of rejection, but it is possible. Yeah, I think I think that keyword around persistence is really Yeah, persistence, is persistence, persistence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're almost reaching the end of the night. I'm I don't think we have any other questions, Favel. So I'd just like to thank you. That's been really insightful. Pleasure. Um, we have a lot of people in the library that borrow your books. Um, oh, some of them you. are attending tonight. So I think they've really got something out of, out of, out of hearing you speak and getting a little bit more insight about what makes you tick as a writer. So yeah. thank you. So I'd like to thank you for attending tonight. I'd also like to thank everybody else for listening to this um to this stream uh, we hope to see you again at another of these events so good night everyone and keep safe thanks